So now it's with great pleasure that I pass you over to Delia Halberg. Hello, hi. So, today we're going to do a small, or actually a big journey through the world of consensus algorithms uh, with all three topics. So it's sort of a coincidence that today we're covering all of us, actually, uh, consensus. But it, actually it's not a con uh, coincidence because uh, there is a lot happening out there in the ecosystem today. So basically I'm going to talk about POS, about PSK, the proof of stake, and Ethereum 2.0 Casper. If I don't know whether you have read about it, but Ethereum is going to switch from POW to POS, which is a massive you know, project. So um, I think it's good for all of us. So I'm a, oh yeah, I am Deli Halberg. <laughs> And um, I'm a governance researcher. So disclaimer, I'm not a techie. I do sociology, I do social sciences, and I'm trying to make sense out of everything uh, to discover the meaning, right? So um, for me, it's always super frustrating to be sitting somewhere and it's like a highly technical talk and you know, you just drift away. So I don't want that to happen to you. My mission is that at the end of this talk, you understand Casper with me. So, first question, who is relatively new to the space, like to the crypto space, or is just starting to get an overview? Please raise your hand. Cool, welcome, <laughs> that's nice. Um, so, who has a clear understanding of what, let's ask, a consensus algorithm is? Okay, so a consensus algorithm is just basically a way to agree, like all nodes, like, like, hey, which chain shall we follow? Which blocks shall we mine? And then all the network comes in agreement. So this is more or less an overview. Um, so who has a clear understanding of how, or no, the other way around. Who does not have a clear understanding of how POS works? Okay, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna go further into detail into that, thanks. And who has a clear understanding of how Casper works? You? <laughs> no. Okay, so you're gonna help me out <laughs> in case I can. <laughs> okay, so thanks for the overview so I can adapt a little bit my talk to that. So, POS, POS, proof of stake, what is that? Should we even care? That's a screenshot from a coin market cap. It's from last Monday, not from last week, so that uh, this part here looks a little bit less depressing. <laughs> Um, and if we look at the top 10 coins, we see that already uh, four of them in the top 10 are POS-based uh, coins. Uh, Cardinal, Neo, Stellar, and EOS are POS, are using a POS algorithm. So apparently POS is catching up, Ethereum is switching, and I'm asking, right? So before we start, I'm gonna explain you my structure. First, I'm gonna give an overview about POS and PSK, the company that I'm working for. Um, the major problems that POW poses, the solutions that proof of stake gives, um, pool of stake, and then we're gonna dive a little bit further into Ethereum, Casper, uh, and I'm gonna explain FFG, and you're gonna understand it. Um, so, as I already mentioned, <coughs> POW is facing fundamental problems. The first one being uh, the issue of centralization. Here we see a pie chart uh, of the mining pools in Bitcoin. And um, this was taken last Monday, right? So we see that there is actually quite a lot of centralization going on. If we count the top three pools together, they already are more than 51% which is a threat to the network. And you're thinking maybe, yeah, that's Bitcoin, but here we are at the Ethereum meetup. Ethereum is doing better. No. <laughs> so here we see that Ethereum is even currently slightly more centralized in terms of uh, mining pool size, hash rate, hash rate power per mining pool. Uh, we see Ethereum mine and F2 pool to already nearly have more than 51%. So 
So this is the first problem. Um, the second problem is the energy consumption. P O W is extremely energy intense. And we see here from uh, March 2017 to March 2018, the energy consumption development of Bitcoin. And it's at 56,000 terawatt per hour right now. And this is something like the energy consumption of New Zealand. Uh, and then you're thinking, oh, but that's Bitcoin and we're at Ethereum. Ethereum is much better. In this case, you're right. So uh, it's only, only 16,000 uh, terawatt per hour. And um, for the people, Chris, for you, uh, who said that, yeah, but Bitcoin and compared to the financial system in general, I took uh, a look. <laughs> so here you have <laughs> one, uh, the energy consumption of one Bitcoin transaction compared to 10, no, 100,000 Visa transactions. So, I mean, it's like comparing apples to bananas or something. I know that there has been a lot of critique of this comparison, but I'm making a point and there is like a point, right? And then there is this third great massive problem uh, with uh, POW consensus algorithms, which is, you know what I'm aiming at? Yeah, yeah, exactly, scalability. So here we see the uh, Ethereum transaction chart, transaction chart and the red, uh, this here is where CryptoKitties entered, or the, D, so CryptoKitties is a D app, the first D app that was running on the Ethereum network. Uh, and basically when this started, uh, it reached up to 1 million transactions in 24 hours and this nearly smashed the network, like transactions were not working, uh, an ICO had to be postponed and the breathing cycle of CryptoKitties was threatened, you know? So um, this is just, just, just examples of uh, what major problems actually um, coins, cryptocurrencies are facing. And there is this new thing called proof of stake, which is solving a lot of these problems. Not all, but a lot. So what is actually proof of stake? In proof of work, you need mining. You need miners to perform work, mathematical uh, algorithms to uh, create new coins. In POS, that's not the coin because usually coins are already pre-minted, pre-existing. And uh, you don't have miners doing work to validate your transactions. Hello, welcome. <laughs> um, but you have nodes like validators that are chosen sometimes randomly, sometimes semi-randomly, and these nodes validate transactions. So you no longer have miners doing computational work, you have validators. And there is no mining reward, but instead you have transaction fees. So if I wanna uh, send a transaction uh, on a POV-based uh, cryptocurrency, I pay a fee for the validator and not for the miner doing work, right? So there is uh, variations of uh, PO, uh, POS. The first one being like classical on-chain proof of stake, which is Peercoin, Blackcoin. These were like the first adapters of um, POS. And then a sub-variation is delegated proof of stake, which is similar adaptation, not important right now. And you have as a second branch, as a stream of thought, you have the Byzantine fault tolerant agreements, which is uh, Tendermint, Stellar, and there you also have uh, variations of it. So Casper is going to be uh, sort of a variation of the Byzantine fault tolerant uh, agreements. Good, so far. Um, there are like other challenges. So miners have their challenges, right? They need to pursue like super expensive ASICs and they have to catch a like, transaction. So um, now there are like new challenges for forgers, validators, or we can call it like mining 2.0 because it's like an upgrade. Um, so basically the probability, so if you, if you are a node, a computer, and you download the client, and you want to start uh, being a validator and proof of stake, um, the probability on which you are going to um, get a transaction to validate 
uh, depends on how much staked coins you have, right? So you're staking your coins, and depending on how much uh, wealth you have in that way, um, you are going to either uh, validate or not validate a transaction. So basically, uh, the more coins you have, the higher the probability that you're going to um, validate. And also your node has to be online 24-7. And some coins, uh, POS coins, coin edge is important. So even if you go online for one second, you're blocked for 30 days, for example. And only afterwards you participate in this lottery of getting to validate a transaction. So this is where a pool of stake, basically a new kind of pool was created. Um, it's actually super exciting because today we launched our website. This was a lot of work, but we managed to uh, launch the website. And this was founded by um, three Italian guys that are uh, very active in the Italian crypto community. And um, yeah, basically they saw where the general trend of the market is going and uh, tried to already catch that trend. So I'm just going to dive shortly into the technical aspect or like a how, how a pool of stake could actually work. And then we're going to continue uh, with Casper. So basically, this is Bob. Most of you know Bob. He's our user and he has a wallet, right? So he owns a POS coin, let's say a Qtum. He owns a Qtum. So he transacts his Qtum on the PSK smart contract, which is on the Qtum blockchain. He makes a transaction and this smart contract immediately um, initiates a transaction back of an IOU token, which means that uh, basically you are always in control of your coins, of your POS coins, and you don't need to trust the pool. You don't have to rely on somebody else making a transaction because the smart contract is doing that for you. And this is also like a new thing that the pool, it's not a centralization, it's not a centralized node, but it's running fully on smart contracts on the native POS uh, chain. So step number two is um, that, so now the POS coin has been transferred, transferred into the uh, PSK smart contract. And then what happens is that the pool starts forging, right? The pool has a bigger network weight start forging and it starts creating tiny little rewards. And for these tiny little rewards, Bob gets daily an IOU back. So basically he gets a credit. And exactly, he can withdraw it. Uh, let's skip it because it's, so the basic mechanism is you uh, exchange your POS coins for IOU tokens. So, um, due to the use of smart contracts, it's fully trustless and fully decentralized. And it also solves the problem for most forgers that they have to be online 24 seven, because obviously we're going to make sure that our servers and everything is online 24 um, seven. So the bigger the pool, the bigger the network weight, the higher the rewards, because you know, the higher probability to uh, validate a transaction. And this is for POS coin holders, a uh, great opportunity to not just let your uh, wall, like coins rotten in your wallet, but to stake them and to generate passive income. So this is basically what we're cur currently working on. Uh, from today, our website is online. So have a look if you're interested. And now we're gonna continue with Ethereum Casper. So Ethereum Casper has been circulating, this ghost <laughs> has been circulating since 2014. Already in 2014, Vitalik and the others started working on it. And it's been really confusing. I don't know if any one of you tried to catch up on it, but there was a lot of like conflicting also information coming up. Um, so now after DEFCON 3, there is some clarity, finally. And that's what we're going to talk about. So in the first implementation, so Casper, you always hear about FFG, CBC, uh, what is that? So it's important to understand there is a, a two-step, it's a two-step thingy. The first step is uh, the friendly finality gadget, which is a hybrid POV, POS uh, system, because obviously Ethereum is a massive ecosystem and you don't want to make like this huge 
step at once, you want to slowly transition. So that's basically what uh, the friendly finality gadget is for. And we're going to dive into that one because it's already enough. You know, it's good to understand first this one. And then the second implementation, which, which is going to take uh, place later, at a later stage, is going to be the pure POS uh, consensus algorithm, which is uh, correct by construction. And maybe if it helps you a little bit to remember it, uh, Vitalik was mainly uh, working on the FFG, the Frontier Finality Gadget, and Vlad was the main, like, uh, designing the CBC correct by construction. So we're going to focus now on the friendly finality gadget. It's important to understand, it's a smart contract. It's just a smart contract, which is a POS layer on top of the regular POW chain. So the POW chain continues as regularly as always. So miners doing work and they mine and new blocks are being created. And on top of that, you have Casper, the FFG, which is a smart contract. If some of you, we all, or probably most of us, own ETH, right? Um, if we want to become a validator for the FFG, we just have to, we just have to uh, deposit a certain amount of ETH on um, uh, a certain wallet in order to become a validator. The, I have written on purpose here X because uh, the amount has been changing. Uh, in the first version of the testnet, so uh, FFG is also on the testnet, uh, I think you had to state like uh, 1,500 ETH, which not all of us can afford. But uh, yeah, I think they have lowered the bar. Um, and also really important to mention here is previously in uh, older versions of FFG, it was communicated that there is going to be like two type of messages that validators uh, can send, uh, prepare and commit. That's no longer the case. So now you have as a validator, so your computer or your a node, and you want to uh, validate a transaction. The only message type of message that you can send is a vote. And a vote has to reach a two thirds majority. Uh, validators by weight means that the two third majority is not uh, on how many people are actually voting on it but on the weight, so it means on the total amount of staked coins that they have, right? So you want to achieve a two-third majority of staked coins. And uh, what is also quite new about FFG and Casper, which you don't have in other BFT algorithms, is that the validators are fully accountable. So that means that at every time, everyone knows what the others are doing, and if somebody does something wrong, then the others will know and will report it. So that's an extra layer of security. And we have a finality every 50 blocks. But I'll explain in a second what finality means. OK, no, don't worry. I have prepared it also visually so that you can see and actually imagine that. It's, it will make things easier, but I'll first um, <coughs> explain that. So you have epochs. That's new. So a miner, the miners are mining their uh, blocks, and every 50th block is a checkpoint. And every 50 uh, blocks are an epoch. And um, basically, the POW miners just do their regular work, da -da -da, they mine. And every 50th block, the, the validators are basically being called, and they're going to say, like, hey, let's vote on the checkpoint, right, on the POS layer. And they're doing that. And finality is achieved when uh, two consecutive checkpoints receive a two-thirds majority. What means finality? Finality means that it's final. You can never revert to history. You can never go back in the chain. It's done. Like, right? This is a very important mechanism uh, against long-range attacks. Basically, a long-range attack is when you uh, prepare things in a way that are profitable for you, uh, you make a scheme and then you go back in history and, for example, you go back to a point where we had like a lot of money and uh, all the others are, you know, screwed. So, so this is a long-range attack and finality is a step against uh, long-range attacks. Um, and the FFG uh, offers uh, accountable safety where it means that um, 
the two conflicting checkpoints. Uh, that there are not going to be two conflicting checkpoints, mostly. And plausible liveliness is that you want your network to keep going, like, right? You want to continue making the next blocks and you don't want to get stuck somewhere and be like, oh, wait, like, oh, what do you think? Oh, no, what do you think? I don't know. And, uh, and suddenly it's not continuing. So liveliness means, liveliness means things go on. The next block is being mined and the next, next checkpoint is being created. So things go on. So this maybe sounded a lot very like uh, theoretic. So, ta-da. This is uh, something that is supposed to be a checkpoint. These are our validators and these are our miners. So now there is a checkpoint and right, the validators have to vote. So the validators submit their votes, ta-da. The miners receive the, uh, the votes and the miners start doing their work. They're working and ta-da, justified checkpoint. It got like a two-thirds uh, majority or in that case it's uh, three-fourths because it's like three validators and one, right? So, so the point got a majority and it got justified. Yay, miners can continue working. In between here, you, just, you should imagine there is like 50 blocks of pure mining going on. I have left it out for sake of simplicity. So now miners mine, right? And there is a next checkpoint. Oh yeah, uh, this is an epoch, the 50 blocks that I was talking about. So there are 50 blocks in between and every 50 block is gonna be like uh, verified. So now again, we have the next checkpoint and the validators uh, submit their votes. When they're submitting their votes, it's always important that they refer to the correct uh, source and to the correct target, which if you later read further into Casper, it's gonna make, it's gonna be important. So um, yeah, so the miners continue mining and ta-da, we have a justified checkpoint, the second justified checkpoint. And we have here a finalized checkpoint. So as we see, we had two consecutive checkpoints in a row, received two third majority. So this one got finalized. So after this one, we can never go back again in history. Oh, we can, but it's extremely expensive. So it's not uh, lucrative to go back in history. And yeah, things continue, exactly. So this is basically FFG, more or less. It's really just a smart contract, POS smart contract on top of the regular POW work, okay? So what is really important uh, about FFG, except for the voting, is the slashing conditions. I don't know if you read into the slashing conditions, but there has been a lot of rumor like, ooh, like super strict slashing conditions, like voters, uh, validators can lose their stake, the stake get burns, oh, it's so strict, you know, you make a mistake and everything is lost. So yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Misconduct is being penalized and this is a security measure because in other POS coins until now, you only uh, rewarded good behavior, right? And uh, black coin, everyone behaved well and they got their rewards and everyone was happy. And then there was this one evil person like, Argh and um, he, he didn't get penalized for the evil behavior, right? So this poses a threat to, uh, the, com to the network and that's why uh, we have two slashing conditions in uh, FFG. The first one being no double vote. So basically, if I'm a validator and we're having our justified checkpoint and we're like, hey, for which checkpoint shall we go? And I secretly vote on both. That's not possible, like I'm getting slashed. And the second one is no surround vote, which is, uh, I'm gonna explain it with the visuals because then it's easier to understand. But basically, if somebody misbehaves, if you're a validator and you sneakily try to cheat, then your deposit gets burned, right? Which is super expensive, it's lost, it's gone. Like, pfft. why? It's not being re redistributed, so basically, uh, why it gets burned is that it makes the cost of an attack even higher. So a lot of economic incentives to behave in a good way to the network. 
And the second one is, as I mentioned already earlier, right? We have this like control. Everyone knows what the others are doing, accountability. So somebody's acting evil. And the other is one's like, oh, I know, he cheated. Like, he's the guy. And then uh, the one who reports gets a reward. And this reward comes from the burnt deposit of the evil person, evil validator. So let's have a look at how this actually works. Okay, so we have our regular situation, right? We have here justified checkpoint, and we have our validators and our miners. Everything's nice. And then suddenly, boom. We have evil validators that double vote. They double voted. So what's happening? Uh-oh. We have two justified checkpoints on the same height here, which is complicated, right? So um, we don't want to have that situation. So what happens is we have here one honest validator, and he's like, oh, wait, I saw that. And he is basically going to provide evidence to the miner. The miner is going to uh, construct mine the next block. And the honest validator is happy because he gets a, report, uh, a reward. But what happens next is that boom, the evil people get slashed and they lose their deposit and it's burned and they're out of the game. So super expensive. This is the no double vote, which is already quite sufficient to keep the network going and to incentivize validators to be honest. And there is a second uh, slashing condition, which is sort of, um, yeah. So it's a second slashing condition is no surround vote. So basically, let's assume that here we're, I'm an evil validator. I want to like create chaos and network. So what I can do, and, and I don't want to lose my funds, right? I don't want to lose all my staked coins. So basically, here is a justified checkpoint, and there is a vote. I vote here, and then I go offline. You know? So I didn't double vote here on the same height. I have included the formula. Maybe some of you are super like quick on formula. That's uh, from the Casper paper. So basically what it's actually saying is that uh, an uh, validator cannot uh, vote on two distinct votes uh, and that they always have to be um, within the span of the other votes. So basically I cannot vote here, then go offline here, then vote here, and then later vote here because like that I would actually double vote, right? So we see like two chains and I participated in both votes. That's not how it's working. So if you do a surround vote, like going offline in between and like playing around with your votes, boom, slash, deposit burned. So this was actually the second uh, slashing condition. This was FFG, it was, uh, yeah, that's actually it. And the good news for you is Yeah. So I really hope that you understood it because it looks really complicated at the beginning, but when you look into it, it's not. And it's super important that we understand what's happening in the ecosystem because it's going to change everything about cryptocurrencies. So, please. Any questions? Yes, yes. Uh, the guy in the gray. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Basically, yeah. I don't know how exactly the mech um, I would say that the mechanism works as a regular POW. So basically, you have that request into the network, and the miner with the strongest <coughs> hash power is taking care of it. Yes, please. So what if my node client is buggy and keeps sending out votes and I'm getting punished for that? Yeah, I think that um, buggy nodes, I mean, if you have uh, the, the client running on your node and if you don't interfere with the code, 
nothing's gonna happen. Like, I mean, there is like full accountability and if, uh, for example, there was a bug in the Ethereum code, then obviously you're not gonna get slashed. But for your code to be buggy, you have to take care that it's buggy because otherwise it's not gonna happen. So then you basically, yeah, interfere with your node. Could you please repeat the questions? Oh yeah, oh, okay, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> yes, please? Um, so that kind of uh, introduces uh, proof of stake into uh, proof of work. Thank you. So that introduces a proof of stake into an original proof of work system, but it doesn't actually um, takes down any proof of work of the system yet, right? So mm -hmm. we still mine and we still use the same amount of energy. Mm. We just put a second layer of POS on top, right? Mm. Yeah, basically we uh, basically F so you were asking whether uh, we continue to have the same situation with POW and we're just putting a layer on top of POS, but we're not solving the real que like the real problems that POW is posing. Okay, so uh, yes, but we also have to be aware that um, this is a very risky uh, transitioning and that uh, you as an ecosystem have to take care that everything that you're changing in the fundaments of your architecture is going to go right. So uh, FFG is just really the first step also as a um, proof of evidence and eventually they will transition to uh, CBC which is then the pure POS uh, algorithm in which we'll, we're going to get rid of POW. Yes, please. At the beginning, you talked about like, a problem of whole rings, like a proof of work, scalability, and centralization. In a way, I'm just trying to understand how POS is solving. Like, uh, in a POS, centralization is still in a place. Whoever has the biggest stake is going to yeah, decide. In the same way, whoever has the biggest power in a poll. So, how this is going to solve this issue? Um, a scalability, like uh, how much is it going to solve a scalability? Like, okay, the proof of work, like we know that it's slow mm -hmm. in a minute, I don't know, 15 transactions or whatever, in a proof of stake, is it going to be really like uh, solving the problem mm -hmm. as of the scalability? Because like, there are other solutions for the scalability, clearly, mm -hmm. like a sharding, plasma, Raiden, all of those like mm -hmm. uh, coming in into the game, but is it proof of stake actually solving a, like a uh, scalability? What's your idea there? So the first question you were asking was the issue of scalability and um, whether a POS is actually uh, solving the question of scalability and um, it is to a large extent. So for example, Ethereum is going to introduce the sharding as a scalability issue, but sharding is directly connected to POS. You cannot have a sharding mechanism with POW, you can only have it with POS. So basically with sharding they want to increase it to like, I don't know how many thousand transactions per second. Um, and in POS per se, by have introducing an easier uh, possibility to become a node, you can have much more nodes. And uh, <clears throat> so the transaction is not that heavy working. And by uh, getting away of this basically work being done, you can ensure much, a much higher transaction rate per second. So um, the code or like the algorithm is giving that possibility, but how like the different chains implement it and what's actually then gonna happen, it depends also on every chain. Um, so it's not easy to speak of POS as such because as I already showed earlier, there are a lot of sub variations and it's BFT, uh, delegate proof of stake, whatever. And then the first question that you had is whether it's solving the is issue of centralization um, to a large extent. So it's obviously going to pose like different uh, questions. So I said like PO, uh, POS is solving most of the, uh, of the problems of POV, not all. I said that. <laughs> um, and basically, yeah, so basically now uh, I think 75% of uh, the entire Bitcoin network resides in data centers and China and Iceland and wherever. So 
75% in data centers. That's not very decentralized, right? So with POS, you can have, uh, like all, all of us, we can become nodes in POS, right? We just have to have a computer which has enough RAM space. We have to have a stable internet connection, more or less. Nothing changed. Like Pure, you can also be a miner. It's just about do you mine or not. And here, it's also about if you are, if you have a little stake, you will be still in a probability theory. I mean, whoever has a bigger stake or whoever has a, like a bigger power, he will do that stuff. So it's the same. Yeah. So you just said that basically in POV somebody can mine and in POS somebody can become a validator. Did you check recently the prices for an ASIC? So does somebody know how much an ASIC is costing right now? Yeah? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, so you have CPU and GPU. I'm just right now just generalizing. So yeah, so the price, there has been a huge market shortage of uh, ASICs or CPU, GPU, and the cost right now is like at 10,000. So you, if you want to mine, you first have to invest that certain amount and then hopefully uh, you get to actually mine a transaction. So there is uh, like real life problems <laughs> to that. Uh, okay, just as a short uh, mentioning, it's all also in the interest of all of us, we have like two more talks and they're also gonna be intense, interesting and long. <laughs> so maybe let's keep the... Uh, two more questions maybe? Two more questions, exactly. <laughs> you decide. <laughs> Hey, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I have a question um, regarding availability. Why, why, there is, uh, why is there like the, the general requirement for being available 24-7? Uh, I mean, like, what are the possible like, attacks uh, that you could perform by going offline as a, as a staker? That's a very good question. I'm going to repeat it <laughs> for the live uh, broadcasting. So basically you said, why is availability so important, right? We can just sum it up like that. So why is availability so important? Uh, the answer to that could take very long, but I'm gonna try to keep it short. So basically imagine that you are in the checkpoint situation. You're like, okay, so who is going to mine, uh, who is going to validate the next block? And then you say, okay, you go. And then suddenly you go offline. And like, oh no, who is gonna, who's gonna do the next vo uh, valid uh, validation, right? So that's why you um, basically, the coin age issue is sort of an incentive to take care that you're always available and that when you get to uh, validate a transaction, you are actually there. Like you have taken care of your connection, basically. And uh, having a, an availability of nodes, it's again an issue of network security, incentivization, stuff like that. I'm not gonna repeat that <laughs> for the live streaming. Um, yeah, you're totally right. And it's always a matter of design choices. So a certain set of design choices has been taken. Um, and what you were just suggesting is also possible, but then this is a different set of design choices. Maybe we can just talk about it afterwards. Yeah, okay. So one, one more, Maurice, you're picking. <laughs> What are the economic incentives that prevent uh, miners from uh, becoming validators or vice versa? They're super welcome to become validators. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I mean, uh, for example, imagine that situation. You are um, a regular guy, more or less, and um, you want to 
uh, start mining and you have to invest like ten thousand dollars you have to set up da -da -da. so it's a lot of like costs and then you have invested all that money and suddenly it's taking ages until you can get to mine a transaction and it's not very profitable so maybe um, currently in the test net it's still expensive but let's say you um, at some point you decide okay I'm gonna stake a certain amount of ETH and I'm becoming a validator and by that you get the possibility to forge and by forging you get uh, daily or not daily rewards that's PSK so with forging you get every time you uh, basically validate a transaction you get ping uh, the fee of the transaction so that's another way to generate uh, to make money basically and it's uh, in the long run, it's going to be more lucrative and more easy uh, for regular people that don't own a farm, a data farm. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I think the two questions uh, are now over. Please, um, yeah, okay. So a lot of things we didn't, I'm just going to wrap up so that you, we all remember together what we were talking about. So we talked why POV is not sustainable. We talked why uh, POS, what POS actually is, proof of stake, how mining 2.0 works, like with the forging. Also, thanks for these questions. We discussed the two components of Casper, me being FFG and CBC. We uh, dived a little bit uh, deeper into FFG voting and finality, and we discussed the two slashing conditions. Uh, I borrowed the slides from Carl. I asked Carl from Ethereum whether I can use the slides. He didn't respond, so I just used them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really asked on I, yeah, I asked on Wednesday, and he didn't reply. So I hope it's fine for you. And um, what we did not cover is the POV POW attack resistance of POS. So you can always have that uh, condition where miners and uh, uh, forgers, like uh, validators, collide, and then that's another messy situation. We did not cover that. Um, then you have the correct by construction, which is the second step of uh, Casper. We did not talk about that one. Sharding, we mentioned it shortly. Sharding is part of CBC. And most importantly, we didn't talk about the Ethereum governance issues, <laughs> on which obviously I'm mostly interested in, uh, but that would be another separate talk. So here you can also have the presentation afterwards, uh, a few um, like really interesting sources where you can get all the information. And because our three founders are Italian, grazie mille, <laughs> thanks a lot. Uh, Pullofsteak.io is our website and you can find me on LinkedIn or just drop me an email or ask me after the presentation if you have some questions. And uh, really, thanks a lot for your attention. <laughs>